I finally met the love of my life. So this is what true love feels like. I finally got my love story. I waited my whole life and finally I have real love. You hear this or you read this and it feels awful. You may even be glad the narcissistic relationship's over, but it still feels bad because you once heard those same things from them. So there's different kinds of breakups, right? There's the long breakup that just kind of takes for a while. It's like a, you know, kind of like a wounded relationship walking on one leg that collapses. And then there's the I never saw it coming breakup. So let's just take a casual poll here. Put your answers in the chat. Which one do you think the narcissistic person is more likely to pull? The long breakup? or the out of nowhere, I never saw it coming. Let's take a look at your answers down below, but let's talk about this. I mean, long breakups are rough, but you see them coming. So that never saw it coming, that's a whole different animal. So again, putting the question out to you that if you've ever been in a narcissistic relationship, have you ever been in a narcissistic relationship? And then you think it's fine? And then it seems like it just falls apart almost immediately. Like one day you come home and you think you're in a normal relationship. You're even thinking about how you're going to spend the holidays or where's vacation. And they say, hey, I want out. They might even be asking for a divorce or something. You might have literally thought, again, you guys were doing fine. Not perfect. I mean, it's a narcissistic relationship. You were probably doing most of the justifying and the heavy lifting. But to the world, and perhaps even to you, the relationship seemed fine. You might have done stuff together. You might have kids. You might do some things together, shared interests, whatever. At least the trains are running on time. Maybe in your narcissistic relationship, there weren't lots of fights and angst and agony. And believe it or not, this kind of relationship, it can happen with a narcissistic person. In fact, many of you might be saying, yeah, that was my experience. I mean, my narcissistic partner wasn't the easiest, but it wasn't sort of this big mess. You may have enough that you like about this person, this, even though they're narcissistic, that you're able to make it work fine. You may even believe you had a decent relationship and just one day, poof, it goes up. Relationships have a life of their own, right? I view every relationship as involving three living entities, you, the other person, and the relationship itself. And obviously the two of you may go on living while the relationship slowly withers away and the life goes out of it. But as any living thing, a relationship, like any living thing, has a life history with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Now, in many relationships, as they fall apart and come to an end, the end of the relationship is not unanticipated. It just unfolds slowly. There's more arguments, there's more antipathy, maybe even more contempt. One or both of you stop caring, you check out, they check out, you may not care if they show up or not. A sort of indifference may creep in, or it just may be nonstop conflict. There may be breaches of trust. Whatever that long trail off to the relationship no longer working looks like, it ends up slowly losing its life force, and it ends. I'm not saying this is easy, and one person may be putting more work into the relationship working. But over time, it slowly fritters away. When it does end, you may not be happy, or the other person may not be happy, but you, and probably the world at large, understands it. Now, can this happen? This kind of slow death of a relationship happen with narcissistic partners? Sure. It may just be years of a slow death march forward, and then one day, Someone just cuts bait. But, and if it's you, you might be the one who gets up and leaves, but there still may be lots of post-separation abuse. If it's them, they may still be punitive. But again, it's not a surprise. This slow trailing end of a relationship is also what happens in what were once healthy relationships. Just the relationship slowly starts dying, and when it falls apart, yeah, there's some grief, but it's also like, okay, this thing needed to end. But that abrupt, I thought we had a decent relationship, and then one day they kind of come home and say, we're done, that, more often than not, is a narcissistic person's play. Like, literally, they can go from what feels like a happy relationship and pop right into a new person, into a new life, whatever that means, 
all while it's seeming like it was fine with you and you're left holding the bag and feeling insane. Then you might start taking out your phone and your calendar and saying, okay, wait, what day did this change on? We went to dinner last weekend. We had sex 10 days ago. They were posting some loved up stuff about me on social media three days ago. Like you start feeling like a character in one of those serial killer movies where the detective has diagrams and pictures and strings on the wall trying to figure out what happened. Where did it all go wrong? Then of course, sadly, a lot of people will go to, was it me? You go back over those text messages that leave you feeling more insane because they may very well have been saying things like how much they love you and lots of babe and XOXO and that kind of thing. You dig and you turn and you keep trying to find the moment, the smoking gun, the penny drop, nothing makes sense. And then, because this is a narcissistic relationship, you literally start to feel insane. What did I miss? What is wrong with me? Nothing's wrong with you. For someone to turn off a switch like that, it's them. How can they do this? Well, first, usually the reason why the switch just turns off for a narcissistic person is because they found new supply. It's a bad feeling, but it's a big truth. New supply brings them something new and shiny. More often than not, it's a new person. It could be someone younger, richer, more famous, more successful. I was reading this past week about some person who left a wife and baby for some flossy pop star and just sort of unceremoniously dumped the wife and kid. I mean, I'm kind of curious what the over under is on the new relationship. My bet goes that, that this new relationship with the flossy pop star is only gonna last about six months. It takes about that long for the novelty to wear off and for the shame to set in. But the narcissistic person is often grandiose enough to believe that their life is some sort of exciting novel with them as the main character, a once in a lifetime love story built into it. So when new supply shows up, they get lost in that BS. Narcissistic people are also status seeking in everything they do. So if someone new can bring status, then they're gonna jump for that as well. Interestingly, narcissistic folks are also quite suggestible. So if someone is dangling riches or opportunities or something they want, but are implying that their current relationship is a drag, the narcissistic person may also be willing to trade the person they're in a relationship with in to make themselves look better. The second thing to keep in mind is how superficial narcissistic people view relationships. Narcissistic folks don't go deep. So walking away from a relationship for them is really not a heavy lift for them. If you have ever planted something really shallow, like in a garden or something, you know that just one heavy rain will wash away your seedlings. It's kind of the same thing here. They just don't go deep. You may go deep, but they don't. So there is little emotional resistance there. Maybe a little, they might feel a little bit of shame of what would people say if they get up and leave a family. But in the supply shame math, the supply for a narcissistic person is more important than the shame. And the shame will ultimately lead them to probably br blame you for the breakup, which helps them feel a little bit better about it. A third thing to keep in mind is that uh, sadly, a lot of narcissistic folks just don't care. They pretend to care and they can perform that for a long time, but their I love you is sort of the way people, other people say hello or goodbye, it's filler. The words mean, I love you, mean such different things to different people. So they kind of become throwaway words for a narcissist. For you, they may feel very real. That does mean that again, new supply will beat out their so-called loving you. And ultimately supply is the driver for the narcissistic person. So it's not really about caring about you because they're kind of done with your supply. That's not an indictment of your supply. You're much more than your narcissistic supply, obviously, but it's an indictment of a relationship in which another human being is being viewed as supply. A fourth thing to keep in mind is that narcissistic people actually believe their own narratives. Grandiose and distorted as it is, it's almost delusional, they believe it. They believe the story about this is their journey and this is their destiny and they have to honor their path or whatever drivel they are making up to rationalize blowing up a lot of people's lives. In this twisted narrative, there's little regard for your pain or confusion or hurt, or they may throw you under the bus. You may not have seen them 
for who they are is what they might say. Or they might say you didn't love them enough. Or they might say things like you were going in two different directions. Even though it wasn't the case two weeks before, right? Or my favorite manipulation is that ultimately this breakup will be good for you too, so you can grow. Ironically, in that manipulation, there's some truth. Ultimately, you'll be much better without this relationship. But the narcissistic person is often a salesperson and a con and will try to sell you on the idea that ultimately their betrayal was good for you. So that's sort of a double ouch. It's very painful when someone who just days before was proclaiming their love for you can turn on a dime and it hurts and it sucks and it feels like abandonment because it kind of is. Yes, ultimately one of these relationships ending could be good for you, but it's a long, painful, and shocking road to get there. But always, always, please understand, this isn't you. To them, everybody is replaceable. And that is related to their malformed sense of self, not yours. The long breakup is a very different kind of grief when a relationship slowly dies on the vine. And there's much more working through, but it does also make more sense. And it can happen in a deep, sustained and healthy relationship. But that sort of here today, gone tomorrow, that's much more the signature move that we see in the narcissistic relationship. So if it's ever happened to you where you're scrambling through and saying, how did we go from I love you, you're the love of my life, have the best birthday ever, baby, to you want to end the relationship? Again, you don't plant a tree deep the first Swift wind is going to knock it down. So this is a question more than a few people have asked me, which is, why is it so easy for the narcissistic person to just cut me out and move on? Have you ever had that happen? The narcissistic person just, boom, cuts out and that's it. And it feels like it's easy because they certainly just seem to be moving off into their life. You got to remember after a breakup, there's sort of two poles a narcissistic person can take. One end of the spectrum is full vindictive post-separation abuse, stalking, you will not forget me, over, being overwhelmed, maybe even scared by their response. And then there is the, they just disappear, kind of forget you exist, walk into the sunset. Sometimes they walk into a new relationship right away and just were able to put you behind them. So you might be thinking, what the hell is the deal here? Part of this relates to how the breakup went down. Did you end the relationship with them? If that happened and they didn't want it to happen or it didn't happen on their terms, well, that's when you may be dealing with more of the vindictive, stocky, flying monkey dodging, post-breakup narcissistic landscape, right? Narcissism, interestingly, narcissistic people tend to have a lot of insecure attachment issues and they don't like to be left. They tend to have abandonment issues and they will feel a sense of vulnerability after a breakup where they don't feel like they're in control. So all of that is raised for them if they're left. And when that comes up, they also feel, they also feel shame. And as we know from what I've talked about with that shame rage spiral, they will lash out at anyone who raised those feelings of shame in them. And in the case of a breakup, that would be you. But let's say that's not the story. Instead, that for whatever reason, they decide to leave you. Narcissistic people do not tend to leave unless they have found new supply. And in an intimate relationship, that is most typically another person, but not always. They may cut and run because they got busy at work and they chose not to talk with you about that, but simply, want their time to be on their own or do what they want because it works for them. Maybe they got a new opportunity in a new place. They don't want to take you along with them or they want their so-called freedom to do what they want without anyone saying anything about it. They may come up with a very good story about why they left, but ultimately narcissistic people do not consider how their actions impact other people. That's far too inconvenient and messy for them. They focus on what helps them allay their insecurity, what makes them feel good. Because here's the thing, folks. Listen, relationships end. It's the nature of life. People, yes, do sometimes grow out of relationships. Sometimes a relationship is no longer working. It happens. 
we unfortunately for and I, I, we've been doing this for a long time maybe less so in present times but we tend to treat relationships as endurance tests in the culture at large and that's its own problem and the narcissistic relationship was never healthy it may have been fun at one point maybe it was mutually beneficial maybe it had its good moments but it was never healthy so it's not as though the narcissistic person is leaving because they believe it is not healthy. That was never on the table. They leave because it stops working for them or because something else is working better for them. They don't bother to communicate or check in with you because that doesn't really matter to them either. They are going to do what works for them. People say, was it easy for them to walk away from me? I don't know that the, that's the right way to put it. I don't know that it's easy for them per se. I think it's simply what they do. Because for them to stop and consider, oh, am I hurting someone with my behavior? That would imply empathy. And we know that is that there's really not much there in the empathy department. For them to stop and talk about it, in a thoughtful, self-reflective way to say, hey, I'm going in a different direction and actually be willing to hear your point of view and come to whatever the end of the story looks like, that's also not in their wheelhouse. At its core, one of the things narcissism is about is about selfishness. They do what works for them with almost no regard for how it affects other people. That's why narcissistic people are able to walk, for example, away even from their own children with little context or communication, or walk away from long-term relationships into new relationships with little regard for how it may feel for the person who has left. I remember talking with a narcissistic dude who left a 25-year marriage and three kids. I, I think they were like adolescent, middle school age kids. And he was frustrated because this dude just wanted to shout from the rooftops that he finally found his person and he was so satisfied and happy and that it was his time. The sense was talked into him. He had a lawyer and a few friends who told him it wouldn't be a good look if he did that. But then he started whining about how it was exceedingly unfair that the world just couldn't be happy for him now that he'd found his bliss. He tried to sell some bogus story that he didn't find his love until he had left the marriage. But golly gee, it sounded mighty suspect that within a month of leaving a marriage that had lasted for a quarter of a century, he found his soulmate. But he was entitled enough to be angry that he wasn't allowed to share his new story, love story with the world. He had no regard for his children, no regard for his former wife, no regard for their mutual friends and family. It was his gross love story and everyone was supposed to pull up a chair and applaud. Otherwise, life just wasn't fair to him. It's very painful that when the narcissistic person is done with you, that they just walk away as though you're a water bottle they're done drinking out of. The combination of the anxious an avoidant attachment style that we often observe in narcissism can mean that the leaving almost comes naturally for them when things feel too emotionally demanding. And interestingly, that hoovering comes out of them needing familiar supply again. Either way, it can feel gutting and dehumanizing to feel like the narcissistic person just gets up one day, decides that it and this relationship isn't working for them, turns out the lights and leaves. It's not so much that it was easy for them to leave as it is simply natural for them to do what works for them with almost no regard for how anyone else feels. And what is even more galling is that the narcissistic folks walk around the world and actually believe that they are nice people who have big hearts. That makes all of this so much more difficult. In the beginning, it stings. But if the narcissistic person left you, I do hope one day you settle into the truth that as hard as it was, it was fortuitous and fortunate. 
it could set you free and recognize and help you recognize it was never about you. All of us are just supply to them. But when they leave you, it may protect you from the challenges of post-separation abuse and stalking and all the rest of it, which can feel even more stabilizing. But it's not easy, and especially if issues around abandonment are a core issue for you. The way the narcissistic person is able to disappear simply like a ghost can be actually something that feels very, very unsettling, painful, and can take a long time to grieve. Now, what do you do with those feelings when that narcissistic person jumps into a new relationship quickly, usually pretty soon after you end, and tells the world that the new person is the love of their life? Has this happened to you? I'd love to know. If you have, drop in the comments. Has it happened to you or are you afraid it's going to happen to you? Because it doesn't feel good. You're with them. It was complicated, but they go meet someone else fast and they might have even been with them before and it's the love of their life. So let's set the tone. You're in a relationship with a narcissistic person. The relationship ends. Very quickly or even within a few months, they enter a new relationship. Well, of course, they're narcissistic, so they can't not be noisy about it. So it's all, I finally met the love of my life. So this is what true love feels like. I finally got my love story. I waited my whole life. And finally, I have real love. You hear this or you read this and it feels awful. You may even be glad the narcissistic relationship's over, but it still feels bad because you once heard those same things from them. So that leaves you in a position of, was it never real with me? Or even worse for some survivors, what does this new person have that I don't? Many people will say that these public proclamations of once in a lifetime love story that they see their narcissistic ex doing can really ping on that whole idea of feeling not enough. Intellectually, you may even think, great, now they're your problem, new person, and not mine. But there's something about having your history with someone invalidated. The disconnect can feel unsettling. Obviously, there are layers of this. If you still had hope for the relationship or still cared, then this, when this happens, it can be utter devastation. If you are done and somewhat indifferent, but have, for example, children together and you're co-parented children are having to see this, it can kind of be awful to have to walk children through this and to accept that your narcissistic ex and co-parent is so unempathic that they wouldn't care about harming their children, who of course the narcissist believes their children should be so happy for them that who cares if the children are a little unsettled by their parents' brand new shiny love story and their makeout pictures on social media. And if you are done and indifferent, well, then that's probably the best and the easiest. But after a while, the sort of wincing faces of people that feel bad for you, it may get on your nerves. Again, the reason they do this has nothing to do with you. And it has everything to do with the narcissistic incapacity for intimacy. Their intimacy is shallow is focused solely on what it does for them, what it gets them. And so every new love story filled with excitement and fresh new supply, it's their new great love story. So when this feels just awful because it is unjust is when they roll into a relationship that gives them the supply that they want. The new partner, I don't know, maybe has lots of money or is much younger or has a nice house or something because no matter how much you genuinely love them and you did the idea that they could trade it all in trade a life you made with them for the thing that ticks the boxes better for their validation it's absolutely devastating and again like i said for survivors it plays into an i am not enough mindset that often even predated the relationship so what do you do when they say I finally found my true love right after leaving a relationship with you. Number one, however you need to do it, even repeating it over and over again, you got to remember this isn't about you. You were supply and then you weren't supply and they always get tired of supply. And that said, you're wondering, how am I supposed to survive this phase of their 
great new love story. The grandiosity makes for a short memory. They are reacting to what is in front of them, something new. They did the same with you. It's not personal, even though it feels deeply personal. This takes a minute. And so you need to, number two, be with the hurt. There will be grief in this process. You may think, oh, you know what? This fool isn't even worthy of my grief. It's not grief over them. It's grief that a process you cherished, loving another person, was wasted on a person who wasn't worthy of you, who was so shallow, who could be so ignorant of your feelings. All of that hurts. Be with that pain, therapy, self-compassion, trusted friends, other supports, all of that helps. But the only way out is through. And that means this is going to hurt. Number three, get the hell off of social media, please. It's so easy. Instagram is basically a glorified shopping mall these days. And Facebook is basically comprised of the conspiratorial rants of your unhinged friends and relatives. It's not good for you to see any of that. And the narcissistic person needs to broadcast their grandiose nonsense. I have no idea if a tree falls in the forest, whether it makes a sound if no one is there. I do know that if you don't have to see BS on social media, in a way it kind of isn't there and you can focus on your healing. I understand if you need social media for your business, that's fine. Then block or fool with the settings so you don't need to see brand new love story posts that hurt. Number four, if you have them, protect your children. If this is relevant, you got to do it. What does that mean? Clean up your kids' social media feed if they're old enough to be on social media. Be the one who brings consistency into their life because the flights of fancy and the new great love relationship for your ex means that your ex is now going to jet off to a tropical locale on the weekend of your children's school play or will flake on custody weekends or leave them unsupervised while they canoodle with their soulmate. Be present. Ensure that you have school and other significant events wired. Maintain their routines and ensure that if you're, if you're able to hopefully get the clearance to do so, if you're co-parenting, that your child has access to mental health services. The narcissistic parent may be insistent that the children love their new great love, and children may struggle with this on multiple levels. Protect your children from the makeup, the makeout pictures, the bikini shots, the vacation shots, the muscle shots, and the other things that may make them uncomfortable. Is it fair that on top of all else, you're having to act as a sentry to protect children from the ex's inappropriate behavior? No, none of this is fair. But being present for your children and being consistent is everything, especially in the midst of this circus. Number five, the injustice piece is so tough. Intellectually, you know that this will end up being the narcissist's new great love story that ends, but it does still feel unjust. While you may be grieving a relationship and they are in Hawaii with their once-in-a-lifetime love story, it hurts. Just like all pain, it's going to sting, it's going to hurt, so let it. The one advantage we have when it comes to heartbreak is time. The vast majority of folks start to write themselves with time and this too will pass with the added bonus that for narcissistic folks, all things bright will eventually fizzle and that's going to happen with this too. Just don't get yourself get hoovered, right? Narcissistic folks live in a fantasy world. Fantasies of endless success, fame, fortune, and grandiose romantic love stories. It's why they often get married so many times. And even when they're getting married for the 10th time, they still have a big frothy white wedding with multiple wardrobe changes. They need the spectacle. So it's really about the spectacle, not the companionship, the consistency, the respect, the compassion, the mutuality of regard, the growth or the kindness. These are typically photoshopped relationships. Grieving a broken heart is the most human of experiences and one of the more painful ones. It is made more painful when the object of the broken heart is denying the experience you had. Your reality was different and you lost your reality in that relationship. It's painful to be reminded of that, even in the aftermath. And then as you heal, 
and are able to get more detached. There will come that moment when their greatest love story, love of my life, soulmate goes kaput. Grab some popcorn with some schadenfreude sprinkled on top and breathe into the predictability of these personalities and your resilience in the face of it. If nothing else, I hope this video is a validation for those of you going through this. It's real, it hurts, and nothing I or anyone else can say can change that. But also, it's a reminder that for narcissistic folks, my great new love is just code for a look, I got new supply. So here's the question, the question that all of you are waiting for the answer for. Does the narcissistic person love me? Or did the narcissistic person love me? Let's go. This is the question, right? Did they actually love you? For some people, that helps them make, feel, make them feel more whole, right? It's a big question. And it doesn't matter if the narcissistic person in question is a parent, a partner, a sibling, or anyone else where we think love would be a core part of the relationship. The question, after the rigors and hurt of these relationships, after years spent in them, after perhaps even hearing the words, I love you, repeatedly from them or saying it to them, the big question that so many people struggle with is, do they, or maybe did they, ever love me? I mean, this is a complicated question, and it's one I come back to from time to time in different forms because it is so distressing for people. And it's actually a difficult question to answer. I love you are three of the biggest throwaway words out there, and yet they hold so much weight. We often say it to end a conversation, to return it when we're told, I love you, I love you too. And a few of us really think about what it means. What does it mean to love someone? And the challenge in a narcissistic relationship is that none of their actions may be pointing to anything that resembles love. They're lying, they're cheating, they're betraying, they're mocking, they're teasing, they're invalidating, but then they say they love you. Feels a little bit gaslighty, right? One of the f worst questions, worst questions you can ask a narcissistic person is, do you love me? Because you're never going to get a straight answer. The writer Bell Hooks said it best when she said, imagine how much easier it would be for us to learn how to love if we began with a shared definition. And in a narcissistic relationship, you do not have a shared definition. What is, it, what is love for them? I mean, in a narcissistic relationship, love for them means supply. It means adoration. It might mean sex. It might mean desire, infatuation, control. It depends on the relationship. You may hear big I love yous on days that, are, on, that things are going really well for them or the way they want or something wonderful happened to them. They get the big bonus or the raise and they come home and they sweep you in a hug and a big I love you. When a narcissistic person says I love you, they are really saying I love me right now and you happen to be along for the ride. Their only reference point is themselves. So the love of another outside of them doesn't really compute. It's really all about how they're feeling. Now, the child of a narcissistic parent will often grapple with this question. Did my parent love me? Same problem. The narcissistic parent may look at the child as an extension of them, a source of validation, a piece of social status, an obligation. So when you ask them, do you love me? You're more likely than not to get some sort of contemptuous response back. Ugh, what a stupid question. Obviously, I love you. I'm here, right? I married you, didn't I? Or come now, all mothers love their children. Or you might even get, what is wrong with you? What are you doubting me? None of that feels good. But when these narcissistic relationships end, or you are betrayed, or you are suffering in one of them, the big question becomes, did they love me? Do they love me? Their primary focus on themselves means that whatever they are calling love, it's probably not going to work for you in the long term. It's always going to feel hollow and self-serving. And if anything, it's really a testament to the function that you served for them. Where all of this goes upside down, 
is when people extend this to, well, it doesn't seem like they loved me, so does that mean that I'm unlovable? No, you're all very lovable. When we are in a narcissistic relationship, it's not about our unlovability. It's about their incapacity to engage in the depth of love. Because that's the issue here, isn't it? What is love? Is love a behavior? Is love words? Is love energy? I mean, that one always throws me off a little bit because when love is energy, and I do believe that it is, how does that manifest? It's risky to say that you feel it because if you grew up in a narcissistic family system, the chaos that often accompanied what was supposed to be love can scramble the signals for anyone with a narcissistic parent. In most narcissistic relationships, we have to construct the narrative of love. We have to pull together the scraps of the relationship, the throwback to the love bomb days, the one day that they were super, super nice to you, the great sex one night, the birthday that they remembered, the food that they fed you, the funny game that they would play with you, whoever it is, it's something. But then you got to make a collage out of all of those scraps to sort of convince ourselves that we are loved by this person. I think ultimately most people would argue, and I certainly do, that love is actions, consistent actions. And love is also the absence of actions, like emotionally abusive or other abusive actions. And those actions put together would mean the words don't actually need to be spoken. And if someone can't love us, that doesn't make us unlovable. It meant that someone else simply didn't have the capacity to love us. Because that ultimately is the real tragedy of narcissism. The incapacity to participate in what may be one of the most glorious of human experiences. To love and to be loved. Because really there isn't anything else. If you can do that and be in that and live in that, that's it folks. And if you can't, you missed out on the best part of this ride called life. This is one of those philosophical questions where you're probably never going to get the answer to from the narcissist, but I think you can answer it for yourself. Understand that they, most narcissistic people, do not have the ability to step out of themselves long enough to consistent, be reciprocally and mutually present with another human being, any human being. So perhaps by your definition, they did not love you. But by their own definition, they did. And maybe the only way that we can define love is not by what the other person says, but by how we felt. I hope that answers that because I'm a psychologist. I am not a philosopher. And this question comes at me all the time. Let's talk about this. Why do I miss my narcissist? A lot of people are so put off by this because they wonder why would I possibly miss somebody who has treated me so badly, who discarded me, who devalued me, who was abusive to me. Why would I miss someone? In the first place, people go, is like, what's wrong with me? I'm a twisted codependent. There's something really wrong with me. And they go there. Before you sort of throw yourself onto that heap of people who have something so wrong with them, it's actually very common to miss your narcissist. So let's start with something. This is actually, we made another video about this. It was this idea that think about how much time this relationship took. The challenge with narcissistic relationships is how much time they took. Think about it. It took time for you to think about them, to ruminate about them, to fix things, to address arguments, to wonder what they were going to be like when they got home, to wonder what they were feeling, to think if they were... You spent more time trying to decode them. And we have a video on that, like why are narcissistic relationships so time consuming? They were like a full-time job. So when they're gone, 
you realize that they filled up a lot of time. And even though it was dysfunctional time, it's almost like even if you leave an old a job, you're like, I have a lot of time on my hands and don't miss a job, but then you might be like, I miss having something to do. But you may not identify it as such. But they do. They took up so much space. And in some ways, that dysfunction was often quite familiar. And it was almost intoxicating. Because you're always like, maybe today's the day I'm going to win them over. It was almost like living, like you lived in a casino with a bunch of slot machines nearby. And you could play those machines every day. It turns out just that the slot machine was your relationship. So there was something very compelling and interesting. And it was like you were constantly caught in this sort of game. There's that piece of it, is that you had so much to do all the time. Another piece of it is euphoric recall. A big issue in these relationships is that you remember the good stuff. And again, we have another video on euphoric recall too. But because of that euphoric recall, you remember that one great night you had out and then the hotel guy sent you a bottle of wine and it was so perfect and da da You remember that night. You may not even remember earlier that day the massive fight you had or much later that night that he was texting the person he was cheating on you with or whatever it is. You just remember that, that one night. I want more days like that. I want my life to look like that. And I'm like, no, you're forgetting what happened later and before. But that euphoric recall means you s literally cherry pick all those good moments and you miss those moments. But what you forget is that it was embedded in this far, far more horrible landscape of invalidation, abuse, and gaslighting. You conveniently forget that. It's for that reason that I often instruct people as part of their narcissistic abuse uh, survivalship is that they actually wipe down every terrible thing that happened in the relationship. So when they go to that place of euphoric recall, they can go and they can look at it. Another reason you miss your narcissist so much can also relate to trauma bonding. The fact of the matter is, is that these relationships are very evocative of a dysfunctional relationship from your past, typically that with your parents. People from narcissistic family systems are particularly prone to trauma bonding. And what ends up happening is that the loss of the narcissistic relationship, it's almost like you're not just pulling the simple two people apart. It's like you're pulling apart this big, tangled, traumatic web from childhood. And you're pulling all of that apart. So now you almost feel like your skin's getting pulled off. It's painful. And now you miss this familiarity. You miss this thing you were embedded in that was so evocative of an earlier time of your life. That's the other thing you miss. What else do you miss? You know what you miss? You miss all that future faking stuff you were promised. Someday I'm going to change. Someday we're going to this. Someday I'm going to that. I know that down the line will this. If we can just get through this, then that. You saw that future faking episode. So you know that all of those big promises kept you in the game. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, someday this and someday that and someday this. And you you kind of miss that. It was almost like you were always waiting. And if you grew up in a family like that, where it's always going to be like someday this and someday that, you knew what it was like to always be waiting, waiting, waiting. And there was a kind of, again, this tense excitement in your life. Months, years would go by and those things would never materialize. And the disappointment would very quickly turn to despair. The same thing happens in other narcissistic relationships. But strangely, you may miss those kinds of, those moments, those, those moments of the things that were promised. You miss the roller coaster. Remember, rela narcissistic relationships are addictive roller, roller coaster cycles, up, down, all around. You remember it, love, bomb, devalue, discard, hoover, up, down, up, down, up, down, unhealthy, terrible, toxic, unhealthy, but at the same time, you also know it's addictive. And talk to an addict. Talk to an addict 20 years out who has been clean and sober for 20 years, and they will often say, I can still taste it. I can still feel it. I still crave a drink. 20 years out, completely sober. There are some things you miss, and those addictive cycles can actually play on your brain in that way that you yearn for them, you long for them, and you crave them. So all of those things together come together. And I think, again, probably the thing you miss most is this idea of hope, the mastery you're going to get, that you're one day going to win.
it's hard to think that getting out of the relationship was the win. And in your more lucid moments, you're like, yeah, I won. I'm not sitting here. I'm not a quivering nerve. I'm not always, a, always afraid. I'm not always anxious. I'm not always fearful. Like, this is really, like, this is good. I feel better. I'm pursuing my dreams. I'm feeling happier. In your clear moments, you feel like that. It's been very interesting at this particular time in history we're at, and years down the line, I hope we still see this video and say, oh, that was interesting. But at this particular time of crisis, more people are missing their narcissists than usual. And that could very well be that at a time of anxiety and stress like this, we often get pushed more into primitive places. That's why people are also more likely to be eating foods from childhood, listening to music from an earlier time of their life. So there's things that kind of push us back, like times of intense stress or transition, that can also lead a person to miss a narcissist. But do you really miss them? You miss all those things I talk about. But some people think, I miss them. Maybe I made a mistake. Maybe it actually was a good relationship. Maybe I was the one who was in the wrong. You go back to gaslighting yourself and believing their party line. You don't miss it. That's why you need to make that list. I really want you to take a look at it. Do you miss being gaslighted? Do you miss being invalidated? Do you miss being devalued? Do you miss being cheated on? Do you miss being lied to? Do you miss those things? Because I'm guessing you probably don't miss those things. I'm guessing that when you put that way, you're like, yeah, no, what? Ooh, God, mm, I'm glad I'm out of that. And you have to be reminded. I can think of a few times in my life, he's in one professional narcissistic relationship in particular. For a long time, I would get caught in that. This was back before phones. So it was like we'd use post-its. And I had all these post-its around the whole perimeter of my computer screen of every terrible thing this person did. I had to take a worse job after that. And I'm like, yeah, dope, yeah, dope, kind of loving this new job. You know, so it really helped me move forward just to always see it in front of me. You might even want to put it old school, post it on your bathroom mirror just to see it and say, yeah, kind of glad this is done. It is okay. Just because you miss this relationship, miss this person, doesn't mean you're going to get sucked back in, doesn't mean you need to text them or reach out to them, doesn't mean you made a mistake. It means that these narcissistic relationships have a perverse way of getting into your mind and really, really tangling up the works. You don't really miss them. You miss all of these other things that weren't good for you. And again, it's a little bit almost like an addict's brain. A piece of that even relates to that. When you realize that, you start realizing, like, yeah, no, I don't miss them, but this may be a wake-up call for me to do some of the work on me so I can learn to value myself, to really actualize myself and really push myself into a place where I'm less at risk of not only being dragged into this kind of relationship again, but also even if I do encounter a person who's narcissistic, not fall for the same old tricks. The fact of the matter is, once you've seen the gaslight once, you should be able to resist the gaslight going forward, but you do need to be reminded of it. Just remind yourself, remember it over and over again, and when you do miss them, recognize that it's just a little trick of the eye. It's that little form of twisted nostalgia that gets all of us, sometimes, to waste money on things we don't need, eat things we probably shouldn't, and sometimes text people from our past that aren't good for us. You don't miss them. There's nothing wrong with you. It's going to be okay. Don't let this little kind of mental hiccup trick you into getting sucked into the vortex again. Thanks again for tuning in. As always, please join us. We would miss you if you left. So please join us. Hit that subscribe button. Join this community and also hit that bell get notifications of our regular content. Thanks again.